This episode is brought to you by Anchor.fm. If you haven't heard of Anchor, you should definitely check them out. It's a super easy tool that anyone can use to create and distribute their podcast. It has everything you need, and you can do it all from your computer or even your phone. Need your podcast cover art? There's a tool. Music and sound effects? They have you covered. Want to record on the fly? It's easy with the app. Now you may be saying to yourself, I already have a podcast. No worries. Just create your account, upload, and publish to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Looking for some walking around money? Anchor connects you with advertisers who match your brand. It's a one-stop shop for all of your podcasting needs. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. You're listening to Biz Quick. This is where Julie and Corey provide quick and useful information to small business owners. Biz Quick is the podcast where small business owners get to showcase their businesses and receive expert advice and guidance in areas many entrepreneurs struggle with. And you, the listener, get solutions, tips, and tricks on real-world topics that many small business owners face. Julie and Corey are the experts small businesses hire when they need solutions. And the Biz Quick podcast is just one way they deliver those solutions. Let's start the show. Hi, and welcome to BizQuick. I'm Corey. And I'm Julie. And on today's show, we're going to have Stephen Oleski, former NHL player and entrepreneur. He is going to talk to us about turning his uh, passion into businesses. But before we bring him on, we want to talk a little bit about that ourselves. Yep. We have worked with so many entrepreneurs who started their business as a passion, right? So something that they love to do, and they were able to find a way to turn that into a money-making venture, which is always an interesting way to um, start out because it starts out more as a hobby and then becomes a job. It does. And for a lot of people, hopefully that job is something that they still enjoy doing because that's one problem that we've seen is myself included. You start doing something you like, and then all of a sudden it becomes more of a chore than it, than a hobby and you don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, that's definitely one um, area of concern. Another one is that a lot of times when you are taking something that you love, that's a hobby and it becomes a business, it, it could start off really, really fast. And so you don't get this really strong foundation built underneath you for long-term sustainable growth. And you, you start to experience problems fairly early on. Yeah. And that's, uh, one of the the biggest pitfalls is that you know you you start doing something one of your friends says hey uh you know that's awesome can i buy one and then one of their friends and the next thing you know you're like oh i can quit my job cool but you don't have a business plan yet you don't have you, you know your core values you might not even have a business bank account yet like all of a sudden you're just like oh crap this is a real thing what do I do now? Yeah. In fact, I think, you know, when we had Shay Butler on a couple of weeks ago from Shay Butler Knives, when he started making knives, he started it as a hobby where he was making one for himself. And it was four years before he ever made himself a knife because the first one he made after putting, I don't know, I want to say like 60 hours into it, somebody was like, Hey, can I buy that? And I think he sold it for a ridiculously low price, but a perfect example of a hobby turned into a business completely by accident. Yeah, exactly. So Julie, in your opinion, um, if I were to, if I found myself in that position, you know, I'm, I'm over here doing whatever, making soaps, making candles, um, making knives, whatever it is. And I find myself in that position where I might be able to turn this into a full-time job. Where should I start first in terms of making that business real? Well, before I answer that, I do want to ask a question because I know for a fact that you have and do make soap. I do make my own soap. And I know that you've made knives. Yes. Have you ever made candles? I have. Okay. So um, you're kind of the jack of all trades, but um, to answer your question of where should you start, I think the first thing that you need to do is map out what the, what the, long-term goal is like, if you're starting this, this, if you're turning your passion into a business, like, what do you want it to be? Do you want it to be a side hustle or do you want it to eventually be this full fledged business? How big do you want it to grow? And then you need a business plan. That's where I'd start. I'd start with a business plan. I would agree on that. Um, and it's, uh, that, that is, a very important part of, of every business. And it's something that seems like a formality, but when you are starting out, it, it, it makes it so easy to understand where you're going. Like you can map out 
your entire your entire business for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, however long you want, based upon certain things like your core values, your mission statement. And those things might change um, as you as you grow, but to to get started, it 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 helps getting all of your thoughts on paper. So you're not just kind of running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Yeah. I think a lot of people also tend to think that if you're not going to get an investor, you don't need a business plan. And that is 100% inaccurate. The business plan is basically your roadmap for your business and how you're going to, how you're going to start it and how you're going to grow it. And I also think people tend to set it and forget it, right? Those that do create business plans don't really go back and look at them. Yeah. And even if you're not planning on getting an investor or going to a bank or anything like that, you never know when that might just pop up. And the last thing you want to do is to, you know, be 11 p.m. the night before a meeting trying to scrounge together a business plan because you're meeting the bank at 8 a.m. the next morning. So if if you have the bare bones, at least it's going to make your life that much easier. Um, And it doesn't have to be super elaborate. There's a, a ton of things that could go in there, but, you know, primarily you're just trying to sell yourself. That's the big thing about a business plan. As long as you have a business that people can understand, whether that's making a product or, um, you know, selling a service, whatever it is, that that it needs to be viable. So the one thing when every time that I've, I've spoken with my banker uh, about business loans, business plans and all that, his, his example is always, as long as you're not doing something like starting a typewriter repair business, if I can understand what it is and it seems like a viable business, that's all I need to know. From there, you need to sell yourself. It's all about who you are, your experience, your knowledge, what you're going to do, um, what you're bringing to the table. That's the important part of the business plan. You're, you're selling yourself. Yeah. And I'm just going to say this. I, you know, everything sort of comes back, you know, over time, things go in and out. So man, if typewriters ever come back, we're going to have to come up with a new analogy because that is the one we use all the time for businesses that aren't viable. Uh, so, you know, here's to, here's to hoping typewriter repair businesses never come back in style. Um, well, they might be, but you know, it's a whole other political conversation we can talk about. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I think too, if, if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that we should really be prepared to expect the unexpected. And when, if you have an updated business plan, it makes it much easier to pull the trigger or to pivot with the, when the unexpected occurs. Yeah. And one of the best ways to do that um, is just to have that foundation built. I mean, you need to, you need to know, you need to know who you are and that's, you know, yourself, your business, your team, everything you need to know, you need to be intimately aware of, of what's going on in your business so that if something does happen, you're not caught by surprise when, um, you know, a vendor can't meet a, a, an obligation or, you know, you lose half your team because of, of whatever it is. They all walk out because of, of something that's happened to me before. Um, and that was not fun. So that's definitely something that you want to work on. And Julie, we're going to have to end this conversation uh, here in a minute, just because we're going to bring Steven on to talk about turning, you know, how he turned his passion into multiple businesses Um, But do you have any tips or tricks that you would like to give our audience before we do that? Yeah, I actually want to tell them about um, our program that we have. We did a collaboration with Matt Reese of Black Anchor Originals on Hobby to Hustle, which really walks people through everything they need to do to take their hobby and turn that into a hustle to be able to make some money from it. And that's where you start for growing your business is just, you know, go buy that program, check it out. There's a lot of really valuable information in there and it starts with building a solid foundation. You can buy the program on our website at sbpace.com. And now let's take a quick break before we bring Steven on. Are you looking to turn that passion into a project? Do you want to turn that hobby into a hustle? If so, we have the program just for you. We teamed up with Black Anchor Originals to create a quick course on how to do just that. The Hobby to Hustle program consists of 14 short videos to guide you through all the basics you need to get your brand turned into a profitable business. In addition to the videos, we have downloadable worksheets matched with each session to get you set up for success. Head on over to sbpace.com to learn more and sign up for the courses. You can click on the special offer banner at the top of our webpage or the products link in our header to get there. Now back to the podcast. 
All right, and welcome back to the show. We have Stephen Oleski, former NHL player, entrepreneur, and owner of ESE and Elite Beans and Brew. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for being on the show. This is exciting for us. So for me as well. So th- <laughs> thanks again for having me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> we're, um, you know, you're obviously very well known for playing hockey. I, um, I know you won a Stanley Cup, and we're going to get to that. I certainly want to hear some stories about that, and I'm sure that our listeners would as well. But our primary audience is small business owners. And you have a passion for being an entrepreneur and you have a couple of different businesses as um, Corey just um, said as in the introduction and we've talked a little bit about before bringing you on the show. Um, Tell us about Elite Beans and Brew and how you got started in that and what, you know, how that's going for you. It's, It's going very well. Uh, I'm a huge believer in building things slowly and building things the right way. Uh, so I had a strong passion for coffee. Uh, it actually developed very, very late in life. Uh, when I was in college, I never drank coffee. All my roommates drank coffee. Um, and it was probably my third or fourth year of pro uh, where I was really looking for, a, for an alternative to energy drinks. And five-hour energies were really, really big at the time. Uh, so I started getting into coffee. And when I originally started, it was you know, four creams, four sugars, and just all the syrups that you could imagine, uh, like a number of people start. And then I started to really understand um, the difference in quality of coffee. Uh, So I I started to move away from the creams, the sugars. um, And throughout my career, I was able to explore a number of different coffee shops. And and I would always pick out things that I liked from, you know, a a place that, and I always support small businesses when I go to coffee shops. So um, traveling as much as I have, you know, I always find places that are unique to that area. And, and I love that concept. And then, um, you know, the, the one-off coffee shops take a lot of pride in their quality and, and product. Um, so I, I love that side of things. Uh, later on, fast forward, um, you know, towards the end of my career, I was able to um, play in California and California is very well known for craft coffee, craft beers, um, everything like that. And, they actually did a special, uh, you know, earlier on, I made an investment into a nice espresso machine. So I was doing stuff for myself and all my friends. And in California, they actually did some barista training at a local coffee shop, um, which was really, really cool. Fox did a special on me, um, you know, highlighting my passion for coffee, taking me through barista training. And I became really, really good friends with the gentleman who owned the coffee shop and um, just a great resource. Uh, took a lot of time teaching me about, you know, the difference in qualities, uh, difference in regions and in, in beans. Um, and I developed an even stronger passion and, and now I can talk about it and, and uh, fast forward past that, uh, you know, I, de- I decided to, to share the knowledge that I had obtained from, you know, my good friend um, and pass that along. And when you teach people about coffee, it's somebody, it's the second most consumed beverage next to water in the world. Uh, so when you can teach people about coffee and, and, and tell them the differences in regions and qualities and, and beans and roast and um and then they start to understand the quality of coffee and, and then they really appreciate a product like Elite Beans and Brew, um, you know, compared to what they're usually drinking. I, um, first off, it's good to know you have a third type of backup career that you can go to. You could be a barista if you really, really wanted to. I don't know anybody who's <laughs> gone through barista training. So that's amazing. Um, I, I love coffee. I love coffee so much, but unlike you, I started, and I'm sure I have told this story on the podcast before, but um, I, I kind of, I'm kind of fond of it. It's also really embarrassing. When I was like six or seven, I can remember during summer vacation, I would make um, coffee. Like there would be nobody home but me and my siblings, and so I would get out like they used to have like the old percolator pots that you would put on the stove, right? And I would put coffee grounds in there. I had no idea how to make it. I was really just making boiled water with like coffee grounds dumped into it. It was like this kind of really light brown color, basically just colored water. And I would pour a cup of coffee and walk around outside drinking this coffee like I was the absolute shit. And I (laughs) I have loved coffee forever. So that is my, that's how I started on coffee. 
no, I think a lot of people can relate to that too, right? Is, is, and there's so many, as you explore the coffee world, there's so many different uh, brewing methods and things like that. But a lot of people only know that coffee flavored water that you're talking about. So, yes. Yeah. And it's, I was going to comment on that because I, I actually was a partner here in Richmond in a, a, a small chain of coffee shops. And so, um, got really deep into coffee, like way deeper than I ever thought that I would, um, in terms of like, you know, growing regions and, and all of that. And it's funny, like, you know, you, you talk about how people kind of start with, you know, four creams and four sugars, and then you get, actually get to appreciate the the flavors and, and, you know, like it's, it's nuanced just like wine or any other beverage. Um, but, um, so I want to, I wanted to get into like where, like how you've turned that passion into that business. So, you know, distribution, um, are you doing all the roasting yourself? Are you outsourcing? Like, what does your business looking look like right now? Yeah, so it, it started, right? I, I mean, I have a small four ounce roaster. Um, I'm operating out of a, a tiny little place. Um, so for consistency purposes, I do, you know, outsource my roasting to my good friend in California, who, like I said, with 35 years in the business, um, obviously is, uh, is an expert in a lot of fields. And uh, very, very, very passionate about coffee. And those are the people that I love to support. Um, you know, people that are knowledgeable and, and share a passion for their product. And, and that's exactly what he is. So I do outsource uh, a lot of that uh, just to keep the consistency purposes, you know, doing four ounces at a time and throwing together a 16 ounce bag is pretty challenging. Um, you know, but uh, my business is kind of built around the customization side of things. So a lot of, you know, my friends and things like that, what we'll do is I'll have them over and we'll do a private cupping session and then we can develop a roast and a profile strictly for them um, you know, tailored towards their taste and, and, and what they like. Um, so I started off, you know, focusing on, on, on the smaller, uh, you know, my friends and, and, and family and people close to me and, and just making custom profiles and roast for them. And then once it started to, to gain traction from that aspect, um, I have developed a couple staples. Um, you know, we have eight single origins and then we have a number of blends as well. And those are outsourced through my buddy in California, um, you know, and those are available uh, all online and everything like that. Uh, you know, so distribution comes right from me. Uh, and I have a, a partner as well who does a lot of the small business packaging and she does a great job, um, you know, with our holiday boxes. She did an unbelievable job. We have a world tour um, where she actually um, you know, spray paints a, a world map on, on the boxes that they're delivered in and just a lot of small little things that we like to pride ourselves on, uh, you know, to, to build that custom experience. Yeah, that personal touch is so important. Um, I think one of my favorite things that has come out of, you know, 2020 and, and the complete and epic chaotic mess that it was, is how well, like, local roasters and brewers for coffee did because so many people stopped going to Starbucks every day and started ordering coffee into their homes. And that's been a really nice thing to say, to see. I think, I think Corey and I have probably tried coffee from like 20 different roasters across the country through 2020 and found some favorites. And um, honestly, one of them is actually located in Michigan and um, I continue to reorder beans from there, but I have a question on your, um, um, on, on the ordering process. So can you, like, could I go online and order like a custom type of brew for myself? Or is that something that's more personalized when you have conversation and sit down with somebody? Like, how does that work? It's, it's more personalized when you have conversations, but our staples are available. Um, you know, technology has changed a lot. Uh, you know, the e-commerce world is, is constantly evolving. So, um, do you have a Shopify site and things like that? I think that's an easy way, um, you know, to, to utilize the back ends and the ordering process. Shopify does a really, really good job. Um, so we have our staples up there, but the custom stuff, custom blends, that's more of a conversation. And then uh, generally what I'll do is I'll send out a couple small bags, see what you like, um, you know, and then develop a custom blend from that. And, and within that, we do a lot of custom labeling as well. Um, you know, this is, uh, end of October actually went out to Colorado and we had um, somebody locally in the area 
uh, give us a lot of suggestions. Uh, it was a group of me and my buddies going out there and gave us suggestions on restaurants and, and places to go, things to see. Uh, so what I actually did was custom labels for her. She's actually in in rink host with the Colorado Avalanche. We did some custom custom labels with pictures that um, you know were specific to her and her life and things like that. And we actually made coffee labels out of those. So. Um, you know, that's more of an experience in, in a conversation rather than just order online and, and try to develop a customization side to things. Yeah. And that's, I, I love having that, that customization that, you know, that, that personality for your own, your own roast. Like, you know, for instance, like I said, I, I was a partner in some uh, cafes here in Richmond and um, the guy who we ordered all of our coffee from, we would go to his his warehouse and like we made our own roast so it's like you couldn't get it anywhere but you know our cafes which was really cool because like we went in and he's like all right we're gonna go at this temperature for this many minutes and then we're gonna lower it to this and then like it's gonna come out and then you're gonna taste like all these things um it was really a really cool experience just being able to say this like you can't get this coffee anywhere else in the world um and we could talk about coffee forever but um we could <laughs> coffee or coffee or beer but uh, <laughs> but i want to get into some of your other businesses so like the ese you have the hockey leagues um knowing that you're an entrepreneur you've had a, a, probably a handful of other businesses throughout your life can you tell us a little bit about those yeah well if we're going to go back that far uh at 16 years old uh my best friend me and him are super super into cars uh, and we have a big flea market here in town. We had, it is since uh, closed down, um, but we actually were selling car audio and wheels at the age of 16. So everything I was making, I was working at the pro shop in the ice arena and everything I was making from the pro shop was going back into our uh, car audio and, and, and wheel company. And um, at 16 years old, that didn't go very well. Uh, but I learned a lot of valuable lessons and it was fun. And, and just the, the value that I learned of the hustle, um, you know, my dad owns his own electrical company. So seeing that growing up around that, I think was a huge benefit to me. And then um, taking a chance at 16 really kind of set the tone for, you know, where I'm at today. Um, you know, so that's kind of where it started. And then going through college, um, you know, playing a year of college baseball, going back to college hockey, uh, never really expecting to make a career in athletics. And, you know, even going through it, you can never plan for a career in athletics because uh, it is a, it's a very, very tough business. Um, so my junior year of college, I recognized a need in our area, Michigan being one of the hottest hockey markets in, in the US. Um, a lot of guys come back, you know, wherever they play, whether it's college, junior, pro, they come back to the area and they don't have a league that they can, you know, that they can just show up and play in. Um, if you're playing with guys that aren't to the caliber, A, you're not going to get any better, but B, it kind of puts a target on your back and the risk of injury for guys that are, you know, making a living playing a sport um, is, is very, very, very high. And it's, uh, so I recognize the need there. Um, so I started a league with all the top pro college and junior guys. Um, and like any business, the, the first year, I think we started with eight teams and um, we probably had about eight or nine per roster. And then, you know, we've grown, uh, we bounce between 16 and 22 teams at any given time um, with, you know, a full 14 per roster. Uh, so we've come a long way um, in, you know, it's the importance of, of networking. I was actually walking in my, uh, my first year at college hockey, I was walking into my last final and a teacher had stopped me um, and she had had a conversation with me and asked my summer plans and, um, you know, we started to talk and she asked where I was, where I was from. And I told her, and she, her brother, she put me in contact with her brother who actually runs the arena downstate here at the time I was at Lake Superior, it runs the, the rink and it's literally seven minutes from my house. And um, we developed a relationship my first year there. I told him I had an idea of starting this league and he said, let's go. And, uh, and sometimes it, it takes somebody around you to, to kind of push you and drive you towards that. You know, the people around you that support your ideas are, are very, very valuable. And I told him my idea and he was all for it. And that gave me the confidence to move forward with it. So we started that in 2008 and I've been at this arena, Mount Clemens ice arena for the last, uh, 13, 13 plus years, 14 years. So 
You really um, hit the nail on the head with the, you know, having the people around you that can motivate you. And so frequently it doesn't come from where you think it's going to come from, right? We think, you know, we've got these really close family or friends that are going to be the ones that are going to push and support and, and really be there. And usually we've found it comes from almost complete strangers or people that are kind of on the fringe of your network and they just work their way in because they're so supportive and they're, they're so helpful in helping you reach your goals. Um, it sounds like you are an exceptional entrepreneur, but we all know that being an entrepreneur is really hard and there's a lot of struggles that come with it. So what are the areas where it's not really natural for you and where you struggle a little bit as an entrepreneur? Uh, I think one of the challenges I really faced with the hockey league, uh, the hockey leagues that are run and, and we've moved into camps in different markets as well. We have a women's league, we have a high school league. Um, and a number of other leagues, but it's it, one of the biggest challenges for me was just developing contacts, right? Like um, I move away for seven to eight months and I'm playing and I'm, I'm focused on my playing career. Uh, and then I'm stepping back in summer and those seven or eight months I'm gone. That's when everybody's at the arena. So developing those relationships and those contacts within that, that side of things was, was a challenge for me as I was getting the high school stuff off the ground and, and the women's league off the ground and um, continuing to stay relevant in, in there and developing relationships is always a challenge. And then on the other side of things, um, the marketing side and, and the technology side, um, you know, technology evolved so rapidly to keep up as a business owner. Um, you know, now you have so many social media platforms between TikTok, between Instagram, between Twitter, and you're trying to keep up with your website. Um, you know, that's always a challenge for me as well. Um, you know, and then, and then understanding those platforms and, and how to utilize them correctly and uh, to maximize that. Um, you know, everybody says a lot of those are free marketing, but if they're not utilized, right, you're spending a lot of time and you're not receiving, um, you know, anything in return. Well, uh, you're not. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and they are free marketing until you have to pay somebody to do it for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. And the time it takes to learn them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but we are, we're starting to run out of time here and we would be, it, it would be bad if we didn't, if we didn't talk about the Stanley cup, yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, mostly what did you do when you had the Stanley cup? <laughs> uh, well, once, once again, we're, I, I know this is probably repetitive, but, um, I never expected to, um, make a career playing hockey and I never expected to be in a situation where, um, I was able to. Uh, win a Stanley Cup. Uh, so long story short, we you talked about we could talk coffee and beer, um, you know, all day long. Uh, my first sip of alcohol in my entire life was at 32 years old out of the Stanley Cup. And to this day, that's the only sip of alcohol I've ever had. Wow. Um, so, so that was something special with the Stanley Cup. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm big about I'm, I'm big with whether it's business, whether it's personal, uh, the people around me are, are mean, a, mean a great deal to me. So uh, my day with the Stanley Cup, I brought it back to the ice arena where I'm at right now um, and shared that with the public, anybody who wanted to be a part of that. Um, and I have, you know, it was it was a great day. The, the arena was packed. Um, and from there, I took it back to my high school. Uh, shared it with everybody at my high school. My high school has supported me. I was actually the first person. Uh, we have a great athletic program at my high school, but I was the first uh, kid from uh, Lance Cruz North to play major major league sports. Uh, so that was pretty cool and unique. Um, and then from there, I, I took it, I just took it to my house and, and had a little private gathering. Um, and that was more tailored to the people who gave me a chance or supported me and put me in that position to succeed. Um, you know, with my parents and, 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 and close friends and then just share the experience with them. And for me, winning the Stanley Cup was great. But seeing the people around me experience that and, and be a part of that, that was that was probably my favorite hockey memory. So that um, tells people everything they need to know about who you are. That is a really that's a great story. Um, and I'm going to ask this question and I don't know if um, I don't know if you'll know the answer. And if you do, I don't know if you're going to want to share it. But I'm wondering if you know of any cringeworthy things that people did with the Stanley Cup that you can share. You don't have to tell us who. I'm just curious of a cringeworthy story. <laughs> I've heard rumors or stories about a couple of cringeworthy um, Stanley Cup stories. Um, 
but a few that I can talk about. I know uh, when the Dallas Stars won it back in the day, I know it was dropped off of a balcony um, and it's been dropped a number of times. It's been, uh, it's taken a couple swims in the ocean um, and just a number of different things. Uh, another cool, unique thing is uh, on the plane back from San Jose, um, actually Phil, who is the cup keeper, shared a number of stories with us as well. So, um, you know, just, just cool things that different guys, everybody, you know, wants that experience to be so special. So everybody has a different approach to the, the Stanley cup and, um, you know, it's just some really cool stories about how guys enjoy their day with the cup. And, uh, you know, it's been dropped. It's been, it's been beaten up a little bit, but I think that's what makes that, that trophy so unique to, to hockey and, and sports in general. Yeah, definitely. Thank and, you for sharing that. And I'm sure we could probably fill in some gaps too, in terms of <laughs> <laughs> other things that may or may not have happened to, to it. Um, but before we go, yeah. um, Stephen, can you uh, tell everybody how they can learn more about you and you know what you do? Yeah, I. And so we we talked about the technology side of things. Um, really trying to work on my uh, social media content in, in in game, and that's Stephen Alexi um, on Instagram on Twitter and everything like that. And then we also have, you know, elite beans and brew has an Instagram handle and so does ESE hockey and all those are available from my personal, um, you know, and, and that's a great way to follow along. And, and I encourage people to, um, you know, with small businesses to, to reach out because I'm, I'm very, very big in developing a network. Um, a relationship I might have may help somebody else or, or propel an idea forward or just somebody to bounce ideas off of. Um, that's one thing that I've had a strong focus on in my hockey career is developing like-minded people and, and, and keeping those people close. Um, and I've utilized a number of those resources, bouncing ideas and, and asking for help and input. Um, a lot of times people get stuck in that, you know, they have an idea, but they don't know where to move from there. And, and they're afraid to tell people because they don't want people to steal their idea or whatnot. But you need, at the end of the day, you need to bounce it off somebody and you need to have help around you to, to have success. Yeah. And that's a great point about um, bouncing the idea off people. That's one of the things that I learned um, in one of my many classes that I've taken throughout life is that, you know, people oftentimes they're not going to try and steal your idea. You know, people like they, they're guarded. They're like, I've got this idea. And it's like, no, they're, they're doing their own thing. No, nope, like very, it's going to be very unlikely that somebody's going to steal your idea and try and you know run with it. So share it, you know, make it better. But thanks again, Stephen, um, and thanks to all of our listeners and all of the ways that you can connect with Stephen will be in our show notes. Yep, and you can connect with us on social media. We are on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and the Facebook, and you can find me on Clubhouse. And subscribe to our podcast while you're out there on the internet. Like us, give us a review. We love feedback. Yeah, when you're on the internet, you can find us at sbpace.com and at bizquickpodcast.com. And you should reach out about any topics that you want to hear because we love to learn about what our listeners want to hear. Also, we wrote a book. It's a number one bestseller on Amazon. It's called Seriously, Now What? A Small Business Guide to Disaster preparedness and it comes with a companion workbook that's it for today's podcast i'm Corey, and i'm julie and this was biz quick helping small businesses across america